Hello and welcome to the two-man power trip of wrestling. I'm your host, JP John Paz. With me again, of course, is a returning guest. He's the world's strongest man. He's a former WWF Intercontinental Champion. He's an Olympic weightlifter. He's a two-time AWA Tag Team Champion. He is Mr. Ken Patera, the world's strongest man. Welcome back. How are you doing? How are you? Thanks for having me on your podcast. I've been looking forward to it. Uh... I have a new book here. Let me plug my book. Jesus, God. Yes. yes. This is almost 80 years in the making. <laughs> there it is. The Weight of the World, the new book by yourself, of course, and Kenny Casanova, who does many great wrestling books. What was that experience yeah. like with the book? Is uh, You know, you are, you're a guy that should have a book. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well. You know, I've, I've had uh, family members. I've had multiple friends and uh, colleagues of mine uh, for years and years. But Tara, with all your knowledge, you ought to write a book. And I said, well, I'm, you know, I was never really into writing a book. And then uh, uh, I said, about four years ago, I got a hold of Kenny Casanova and he didn't have time to write it, but he eventually wound up writing the majority of it. But he put me on uh, to uh, a new guy that he had hired uh, as a writer, I guess. But uh, the guy uh, uh, just dropped the ball. You know, I figured it'd be about two years and uh, we started off fantastic. We gave a ton of, uh, ton of uh, information and everything, but then he dropped the ball. He did. He changed everything. I, I, that might be my fault because I, I, I gave him leeway uh, to write it as a, a novel instead of, you know, like a wrestling book. And uh, he put so much of his own philosophy and there, uh, he just got carried away. And so we went back and corrected a lot of it. And so uh, it's going to be published here uh, within the next week or two. And it'll be uh, for sale uh, April Fool's Day. <laughs> Ooh, perfect. Right? Yeah. Perfect for WrestleMania, too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when's WrestleMania? The first. Oh, it is. Okay. Yep. Okay. That's great that you got the book. That's great though you got the book because you got quite a history there. You got quite a career. Yes, I did. I uh, I can say that I enjoyed ninety nine point nine percent of it too. I uh, I don't think a lot of wrestlers can say that. Uh, Ric Flair wrote the. Uh, uh, opening of the book, uh, the for, forward, and uh, Rick and I were real close friends uh, prior to becoming, uh, uh, prior to being in wrestling. Uh, we had a house uh, that we uh, shared with a, a couple other people, and God, I'll tell you, that was the original animal house. That was in, uh, God, what year? 1971. Uh, yeah, 1970. Maybe even 70, 71. And uh, it was party time every night. And uh, you've heard stories of Ric Flair. Oh, yeah. And uh, that he was maybe uh, a little worse than. Uh, 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 prior to becoming a wrestler, I think he toned it down about one percent. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I've known Rick through thick and thin, and uh, we're friends to this day. Yeah. With that though, was that AWA Minnesota? That's when you got into the business, basically. Yeah, yeah, we were. We had a house up here in uh, Minneapolis. Well, Rick's from Minneapolis. I'm from Portland, Oregon. And the way I got back to Minneapolis was uh, my brother, Jack Patera, was defensive line coach for the Minnesota Vikings at the time. Uh, the Purple People Leaders. Yes. Uh, is what they were called. And uh, 
So I called Jack and I says, you know, I, I have an opportunity to talk to a Vern Gagne. And I said, do you know him? And he says, yeah, as a matter of fact, I was out to his uh, uh, house on Lake Minnetonka last summer, a big barbecue. He, he invited all the people from the Minnesota Vikings uh, to come out to his house. And everybody went, well, the head coach, Bud Grant, had played football and went to uh, college at the University of Minnesota with Vern Gagne. Yeah. So that, that's how all that happened, yeah. Did you think you wanted to get into the wrestling business? Because obviously, you know, you're an Olympic athlete, a weightlifter, a strongman. Did you want to get into pro wrestling or no? Yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you. When I was 10 years old, my mom and dad went out and bought a TV set. And uh, I didn't, uh, you know, 10 years old, I didn't know, know anything about wrestling. We didn't have a TV. And, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, just prior to uh, me turning 10, they didn't even have uh, wrestling on TV. But when TV came on, uh, Portland uh, wrestling came on at the same time while well, it was an instant hit, you know. Uh, and uh, then they had Texas uh, Rough House Wrestling. Then they had wrestling from the Cow Palace in San Francisco. Of course, those were all taped, and they were about four, four to eight weeks you know, uh, old by the time they got to Portland. Because back in those days, everything would be taped and then shipped to uh, various uh, TV studios around, yep. you know, whoever they had contract with. And uh, so, yeah, it was, uh, I, uh, me and my buddies, uh, we were the only family in the neighborhood that had a TV set in 1953. And uh, so I invited all my buddies over, a bunch of little assholes, you know, they <laughs> to come in and bust my mother's uh, living room up every Saturday morning. Uh, after about a month or two, I think every piece of furniture in the house was broke. I, you know, what, 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 I why would that happen with 12 or 14 uh, 10 year olds? Oh, you know, jumping yeah. all over the place. Yep. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank God the TV never got hit. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have been screwed. Yeah. Yeah. So I know I've, uh, and then the gym, uh, I, I, I uh, joined a gym, Sam LaPrinzi's gym in Portland when I was just right out of high school. I, I just turned 17. And uh, I was always interested in weightlifting. And uh, the, the guy that turned out to be my weightlifting hero was um, uh, Norb Shemansky from Detroit. And he went to four four Olympics, and uh, he was a great guy. I I got to meet him in uh, gee it was 1971, and then uh, uh, he came to the Olympic trials in '72, which happened to be in his hometown uh, of uh, Detroit, Michigan. And that, that was a real honor for me to have him there. And uh, when he come, his last Olympics was uh, 1964. And he was, I think he was the oldest weightlifting com competitor ever. He was 43. And he won a bronze medal against those two bad Russians, those two commie bastards. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, that's how all that happened. Yeah, but I I was always a wrestling fan. And uh, the gym I joined, Sam LaPrinzi's, all the professional wrestlers that uh, wrestled in Portland and the Pacific Northwest area, they all all came in and trained at Sam's. And uh, so I, I met a lot of them. And uh, so, uh, but yeah, so anyway, 19... Uh, 72, 
I, after the Olympic Games in Munich, Germany, I came back from Germany and uh, went to Vern Gagne's camp. And Ric Flair had always been bugging me about going. And, of course, we, we lived together for almost two years prior to that. And I, I finally got him into the wrestling camp. And uh, there were six of us. There's Rick, myself, Cosro Vasiri, who uh, later turned out to be the Iron Sheik. Sheiky baby. Yep. Um, and a kid by the name of Bob Bruggers, uh, who played football for the Miami Dolphins, and uh, the, high, uh, the High Flyers, Jimmy Brunzel and uh, Greg Gagne. So, I mean, we had a hell of a camp. Unbelievable camp, yeah. 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 Basically, yeah. all Hall of Famers are future stars, you know, in their own right, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, true. I've I've, I've been in a couple Hall. I'm in a couple Hall of Fame, uh, weightlifting Hall of Fame, of course. And I was the quickest to ever be inducted into that one. Uh, I think it took them two months uh, after the Olympics. They sent me this great big, you know, plaque and all the hoopla that goes along with getting inducted into the Hall of Fame. And then I was uh, inducted, uh, God, what was it, seven years ago? I was inducted into the St. Louis Wrestling Hall of Fame down in St. Louis. Uh, and that, that That's a real prestigious uh, Hall of Fame. And uh, I, I mean, not, nothing but top... Uh, performers were in there all the way from Lou says the funk uh, brothers to Harley race to uh, I'm, I'm sure Rick Flair is in that one too but yeah not not nothing but top talent you know I was I'm gonna have to pat myself on the back here sure yeah I when I won the intercontinental belt uh, from yeah. Pat Patterson now Pat Patterson never won it it I know, him. right? Huh? I know, right? Bonus, bonus tournament or whatever that was. Yeah. Well, that was a fictional uh, tournament down in Argentina or Brazil or something. Yeah, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Yeah. Yeah, there you go, Rio. Yeah. So anyway, uh, when I beat him for the Continental uh, Championship belt, who did I beat? I didn't beat a champion. So I was the first champion of the Intercontinental Belt. A couple of weeks later, I was in St. Louis, and uh, I won the Missouri State Championship, which had the same prestige practically as the NWA or the WWF um, championship belt. So I was the only one in wrestling history to own the Intercontinental belt and the Missouri State Championship belt at at the same time. So that was, um, uh, you know, for, for a milestone, I think that was probably the top of my uh, 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 gimmicks in professional wrestling. I mean, I, I, I held the uh, Mid-Atlantic belt, heavyweight belt, twice, I think. Uh, uh, I had uh, uh, tag team belts with Big John Studd uh, down there. I was uh, Jerry Blackwell, and I had the AWA uh, tag team belts up here in uh, Minnesota and uh, so I mean, I yeah, almost everywhere I went, I had a championship belt. Uh, Georgia Championship Wrestling, I had that belt a couple times, and uh, yeah, yeah. So I, I I had a lot of belts. Oh yeah, never, never kept any of them. I always gave them back to the promoter. Damn. Yeah. I was going to ask you if you consider yourself the first IC champ, just because Pat Patterson technically didn't really win it, so to speak. You know what I mean? I was going to ask you that. So we're kind of in agreement that you were the first IC champ. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, you know, Pat was a hell of a performer. 
I mean, I, I loved wrestling Pat Patterson. And uh, uh, his ex-tag team partner, Ray Stevens, I wrestled Ray Stevens uh, in uh, Minneapolis as a rookie. My rookie year when uh, Ric Flair and I broke into the business, I had the pleasure of uh, wrestling uh, Ray. And at that time, he was considered the greatest wrestler in uh, in wrestling at that time uh, as a performer. Oh, yeah, no doubt, yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean, he was so glad to get in the ring. Next thing you know, everything was so easy, you know. <laughs> he... He'd put you in holds, take you out of holds, do this, do that, made you look like a million bucks. And you get back to the locker room, I say, God, uh, I didn't do anything. <laughs> but that was Ray. He'd make you look good. That's where yeah. Flair got a lot of his style from. Yeah, right? Huh? That's where Flair got a lot of his style. And some oh, yeah. From. Oh, yeah. Uh, you remember a kid by the name of Paul Pershman? Doesn't sound very familiar, no. Buddy Rose. Oh, that sounds very familiar. Yes. That's Buddy yes. Rose. His real Wow, I never he, knew his real name. Wow, it's amazing. They never knew that. Yeah, Paul Pershman. He passed away a few uh, years ago out in Portland, Oregon, out in my hometown. He met a girl out there and fell in love. And you know how the story goes, you know. Oh, so yeah. you always stay where the, the wife's family is because the the little lady doesn't want to leave the family, of course. You know? Yep, yep. And uh, but yeah, Paul Pershman is uh, Buddy Rose. And anyway, uh, uh, Buddy's from Minneapolis or Bloomington, Minnesota. Out by uh, he grew up uh, out where the Mall of America is now. And uh, he uh, he 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 used to go out in the backyard and pound sticks in the ground and then put string or rope around like, like a wrestling ring yeah. and him and his uh friends uh would have wrestling matches in his backyard yeah right right, right on the grass and uh so I like he was doing uh, he was doing ray stevens shit when he was 10 years old and uh, just like rick flair did yeah yeah, yeah. Ray was, I think, uh, one of uh, Ric Flair's favorite wrestlers when he was growing up. Yeah, definitely was uh, imitating him uh, for sure. Yeah, with uh, you and Nate, though, you as big of a party or as as Nate, or you not quite. Do what now? Are you as big of a party or as Nate, or not quite? Like drinking and stuff. Would you do as much as him? Oh, I. When I met Rick, I was I was only drinking about 15, 20 beers a day and a bottle of whiskey. And that, that's because I, that's because I was training for the 72 Olympic Games. <laughs> oh yeah, I was hardcore Elkie for years. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah, I, I don't drink anymore, but uh uh I used to say, yeah, people would ask me that over the years. I say, yeah, I don't drink anymore. But I don't drink any less either. <laughs> but yeah, I I, I quit drinking. Uh, uh, yeah, Rick still pounds them down pretty good. But when I first met Rick, he was only twenty one, and uh, so he didn't have uh, uh, a lot of years to get geared up to my level. And uh, but you know what. When I started wrestling, I fit right in because everybody was a drunk. I mean, God, it, you know, guys, uh, you know, I, I have to hand it to the old timers back in the 70s and uh, 80s. They never drank during the day, to, to my knowledge, because I never drank during the day. It was always after the show uh, when we were going 100 miles an hour down the freeway. Uh, to, you know, I'll tell you a funny story. People ask me, what was your toughest match, Patera? I said, well, I've only had about three, four, five thousand, maybe five thousand matches. But I'll tell you, my number one opponent, 
the hardest match I ever had was that fucking concrete highway. You know, they said, what? I Travel said, road. driving. Yeah, when, we, when I started in the business, we were driving, you know, my, my first car, a big uh, 1973 uh, uh, Oldsmobile. And four door, I mean, that was uh, the, you know how big cars were back in those days. These things were fucking tanks. Yeah, you know, eight miles a gallon if you're lucky. One hundred twenty six thousand miles that first year. Wow. Yeah, yeah. People say what? I said yeah. That's not counting the airplanes. The the amount of time we were in the air. Of course, we didn't fly a lot back in those days, but we, you know, we did our fair share. And uh, so I, uh, you know, people can't get over it. You know how how much time we spend away from home. You know, shit. But luckily, that first uh, that first year and a half, I was uh, wrestling uh, up here in Minnesota. You know, I, I had bought a house and uh, got married and all that good stuff, you know, touchy-feely shit. And oh, yeah. uh, I was home. I think I only had three or four hotel rooms a month. So that was unusual. And uh, then I started, you know, uh, after... Uh, AWA, I went down to uh, Texas, uh, worked for Fritz von Erich and uh, Paul Bosch down in Houston, and uh, uh, Joe Blanchard, uh, Tally Blanchard's father uh, down in San Antonio. He ran San Antonio and Corpus Christi and four or five other towns around there. But uh, yeah. Yeah, I feel like your first big break. I know AWA and World Class and everything, but really, when you go to WWF in the mid '70s and you start feuding with Bruno San Martino, that was like a huge, you know, that's a huge thing. You're getting a WWF title shot against Bruno, and you won the first time out. I think it was a DQ or something, but you know, if you basically come out a victor, to me, that was like the the um, I don't know the launchy pad, if you will, to superstardom with the Bruno feud. Maybe I'm wrong, but what do you think? Right. Well, I I wrestled Bruno about twenty five, maybe thirty times, and you know three times in Madison Square Garden, three times in Boston Garden, three times in uh, uh, Pittsburgh, three times in Philadelphia, and so. Uh, but you start adding all that stuff up. How often I wrestled Bruno? It was about twenty five times, I'm sure. Uh, maybe more, and uh, I had great matches with Bruno. I mean, I, you know, I, I idolized the guy, uh, and and then I find out when I got back to New York, Bruno comes over to me and says, "Ken, I followed you through college. I followed you through your whole weightlifting career, Olympic Games, Pan American Games." Uh, the national championships, the world championships. Man, he was going on and on and on. He knew my whole history. I mean, wow. yeah, he knew everything about Ken Patera. I says, uh, Bruno, I said, you know my whole life. He said, yeah, probably pretty much. He said, I followed you for years. And uh, he says, I really respect your uh, – athletic ability and your accomplishments, especially going to the Pan American Games and the uh, World Championships and uh, the Olympic Games to put the you know, crown on. And uh, he says, yeah, he said, we're going to have a good time here in the WWF. And we did. We really did. Yeah. It's amazing. One of the all-time greats is following your career. Obviously, your, you know, your Olympic career and stuff, but that's pretty cool because he's known as, at that point, the, the god of the WWF. I mean, he, he was the king. Yeah, he was. I am, he, he sold out Madison Square Garden, I don't even know, 150 times. 
and that that was over years, you know, years and years, 100, 100 because we only wrestle in Madison Square Garden once a month. And uh, so, I mean, he took on all comers. He, he wrestled everybody. You know, he started off beating uh, – uh, uh, Buddy Rogers? Yeah, na nature boy uh, Buddy Rogers. And that, that's where Ric Flair uh, picked up his uh, gimmick name, nature boy Ric Flair, nature boy Buddy Rogers. You know what? <laughs> yep. Yeah, very flamboyant, uh, and uh, uh, I never wrestled Buddy, but I uh, uh, he had a feud going with Jimmy Snuka down in the Mid Atlantic territory when I was feuding with Johnny Valentine, and uh, yeah, so uh, I was around Buddy Rogers quite a bit. As a matter of fact, when he uh, came down to Charlotte, you know, uh, Crockett Promotions in the Mid-Atlantic area is what it was referred to back in those days. But uh, Buddy bought a house about three blocks from me. And I, you know, I was talking to him. I said, God, are you, uh, I said, why would you buy a house here? And he said, well, I'm moving in. And I said, well, you're going to be around. He said, oh, yeah, I'm here. I says, great. And I said, Ric Flair loves you. He said, that's why he said, and that's when Rick uh, uh, started calling himself Nature Boy uh, Ric Flair is after Buddy had left uh, the territory. Yeah, yep. because you couldn't have two Nature Boys. No. You know? <laughs> yeah, when but that, that was good shit, yeah. When you were wrestling Johnny Valentine, was he stiff? Because uh, everyone says how stiff Johnny Valentine was. He wasn't as stiff as me. <laughs> <laughs> I'd hit him back, and he says, God damn it, but there, lay it in. I said, well, who McDaniel told me to lay it in? I just did. No, harder, harder. He said, holy smokes. About tough yeah, guy. I mean, you know, Johnny wasn't no spring chicken. Then he was about 40. You know, and uh, I was only a couple of years out of the Olympic Games. You know, I was a big, strong, you know, motherfucker. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, but most, and when I worked with Wahoo, Wahoo was the same way. Lay it in, Patera, lay it in. I fucking beat him. And, uh, yeah, well, I'll tell you a funny story about Wahoo McDaniel. Uh, when I was 16 years old, my brother had just got uh, drafted to the Dallas Cowboys. He's playing middle linebacker for him. So the powers to be uh, that own the Cowboys down in Dallas, Texas, they're going to come to an area that's a lot cooler. So they come up to uh, McMinnville, Oregon, I think it was, and uh, not too far from Portland. And so they were training up there. And this is my brother's rookie year with the uh, uh, Cowboys. So I, I went out there uh, to the training camp with some friends of mine, and uh, it was 105. Then the next day it was 104. The next day it was 106. And I, I, I talked to my brother in the locker room after every uh, practice session. I said, Jack, I said, why did you guys come up here to Oregon? Well, the management thought that it'd be cooler and maybe even raining a little bit. I said, we're in the middle of a drought. There's no rain. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, it wouldn't be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they were there for 10 or 12 days and they were supposed to be there like three, four weeks. Well, I, after about 10 or 12 days, they packed up and and went back to Texas <laughs> because it was hotter in Portland than it was in Texas. <laughs> wow. Crazy. <laughs> oh, man. But, in, but anyway, Oahu, 
had uh, just got uh, drafted out of Oklahoma, University of Oklahoma. He was, I think he was three-time uh, 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 All-American All there uh, when uh, Bud Wilkinson was uh, the head coach. And for I, I don't know how many people in our audience is going to remember but Bud Wilkinson and Oklahoma, but they they won like a thousand games in a row. I mean, they were you know the college champions forever. And Wahoo McDaniel played uh, linebacker for them. And anyway, uh, when he got drafted to the Dallas Cowboys, uh, my brother was middle linebacker and team captain. And uh, Wahoo made it to the third cut. He survived the first two cuts. The third cut, they gave him his release. Well, don't you know, the New York Jets picked him up. And uh, so he was going to uh, New York City. And uh, so when he gets there, he just he got over like a million bucks, and then a few years after that, they drafted uh, Joe Namath as their quarterback. Wow, shit! He had Joe Namath throwing the ball and uh, Wahoo on defense, uh, you know, just beating the piss out of everybody. And uh, Wahoo was as big as Joe Namath, believe it or not. When, when Wahoo would make a tackle on the field, everybody in the stands would say, Wahoo, Wahoo, Wahoo. <laughs> so, I, I mean, he was over, yeah. yeah. When you talk about New York, though, going back to WWF, I'm always just curious with, like, Bob Backlund versus Superstar Billy Graham. I know you had title matches versus both those guys, but a lot of people always said, like, wow, Superstar should have kept the title. I don't know why he dropped it to Backlund. Like, he was so over. What do you think? Backlund versus Superstar Billy Graham. Like, Backlund had a five-year title run. Graham was, you know, kind of cut short on his. Yeah. Well, it's called politics. Uh, when, when I was there, you know, they were thinking about putting the belt on me. Uh, while the innuendos were flying around, blah, blah. And Bruno came to me two or three times, said, Kenny, I want to put the belt on you. I'd like to have you have the belt. But Vince made a deal with Eddie Graham down in Florida to put it on uh, superstar Billy Graham. And I said, really? And I said, well... He said, "But you're going to get your chance. You're going. You're you're going to eventually wind up with the." Oh, fuck! Here, just a minute. <laughs> I don't know what that is. My Alexis is going off. Oh, you must. Maybe we said something. I don't know. That's weird. It's weird that it went off. No, I don't think so. Weird. But anyway. It just went off now. But anyway, uh, so uh, uh, then uh, they brought Bobby Backlund in and put him on TV for one year. Just, you know, crushing him over every, every week on TV. And uh, Bobby from Princeton, Minnesota, which isn't too far from uh, where I live, maybe 100 miles uh, up here in Minnesota. So anyway, uh, then uh, I'm thinking to myself, God, this guy is awfully uh, uh, bland, you know. Yeah. But, but Bobby wrote a nice chapter in my book. So for those that are Bobby Backlund uh, fans, he wrote a real nice uh, chapter. And uh, so anyway, uh, uh, I think Bobby Backlund was down in Florida at the same time as Superstar. So, or maybe he came right after. Anyway, they, uh, 
they brought Superstar up here, and him and Bruno did a, a little uh, program, and they put the belt on Superstar. It wasn't very long. How, how long did Superstar have the belt? I think it was less than a year, which is crazy. Back oh, yeah. Then. Yeah, yeah it was then, way less. Huh? Yeah, because back then, I mean, you held the title for uh, a long time. You know what I mean? Like Bruno had it for eight years. Um, Pedro Morales had it for a long time. Like usually you held it for a while. So it was a short run for, for Superstar. Yeah. Well, then uh, I get the old man, Vince, Vince's father, uh, I heard him talking to Phil Zacco and Gorilla Monsoon one day uh, over at TV. They, they, they were away, but, I, but I, I could hear a little bit of what they were talking. The old man was pissed off at Ivan Koloff and superstar Billy Graham. And uh, this is before they put the belt on superstar. But anyway, uh, he says, I'm going to bring a kid in here uh, from Minnesota. He's wrestling for Eddie uh, Graham. And uh, the Funk brothers uh, broke him in out in Amarillo. And I'm going to put a belt on him. And that's somebody I can control. I can't control all these uh Supreme Eagle Maniacs that get that fucking belt. And uh, he had mentioned Ivan Koloff and Superstar. He was upset because those guys would always hold him up for more money. Wow. Okay. You know, let's say uh, they made 5000 wrestling in the Madison Square Garden. Well, then they'd come back and want 7500 7, yeah, you know, shit like that. I, I never did that to any promoter. Never. Never. Um, unless I really got fucked. <laughs> right, right. Of course. But, which, you know, so, so, some promoters were so shady. I'm not going to mention their names, though. But anyway, uh, um, so that's how that came about. Uh, Superstar had a very short run for uh, WWF uh, champion. Yeah, it, it was less than a year, a lot, lot less than a year. So then uh, they brought, because Bobby was already in the WWF, but like I say, for one year to the day, one year, they put him on TV every, every week with, uh, you know, squash jobs and stuff. And uh, uh, so the old man thought that was going to be the way to push Bobby back to the top. So when it came time for Superstar to drop the belt, it was him and Backlund. And uh, so uh, I can't remember. Why, why, where did Backlund beat Superstar at? You you remember? Uh, I thought it was New York, but I could be wrong. I'm, I don't remember. Um, I I don't think it was New York. I think it was uh, oh shit, Pittsburgh or Boston. No, not Boston. Oh, I thought it was at MSG. Yeah, it, it probably was. Met. Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, I was thinking of uh, Bruno and Superstar. Oh yeah, I, I think Bruno and Superstar was Baltimore or something. Yeah, yeah ba Baltimore. Back on yeah. wins. Back on definitely wins it in MSG. Yeah. 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 Right. MSG. Sounds like the name of a beer. <laughs> MSG, Madison Square Garden. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah. So when uh, Backlund uh, took the belt, uh, you know, everybody says, "Ah, the territory will die. Backlund won't draw a dime." Well, he did draw a dime because when I wrestled him. Uh, you know, l l later on, uh, I don't think I was in the WWF when Backlund beat him. I, God damn, I, everything's a little fuzzy there. But anyway, Backlund and I wound up wrestling about uh, 20 times. As a matter of fact, in 1980, we were voted uh, Match of the Year. 
if you recall that, you yep. know, in Wrestling Illustrated. Yep. Yeah, so I, 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 and that was in Madison Square Garden. Uh, that match we went about thirty minutes, I think. And uh, but uh, we, uh, uh, I had a good run with Backlund. We sold out everywhere. We sold out Pittsburgh. Washington, D.C., Baltimore, Boston. Uh, we sold out everywhere that, uh, you know, especially in the big arenas. Yeah, you got to give him credit. Uh, he, he, he drew pretty well. I mean, people can say what yeah. they want, but you got to give him credit. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, one of the, especially with me, when, uh, when I had my run with Bobby, it was a long run, too. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody felt that there's no way Backlund's going to keep that belt. Patera's going to beat the shit out of him and take take the belt. That was the feeling of the fans. When he'd come out to the ring, everybody would spin, especially in Madison Square Garden, Philadelphia. All the fans, you know, 20,000 people, they'd be on their feet. It's howdy doody time. It's howdy doody time. <laughs> oh, God, I just, oh, man. Uh, it was funnier and shit. Yeah, because the way he'd come in, you know, yeah, he, was yeah. in, he was in such fantastic condition. The guy was like a machine. You couldn't slow him down. And uh, so, uh, yeah, he... He was perpetual motion all the time, just constant, constant, constant. And uh, so that's, uh, he just had an air about him, you know, that not the same type as Bruno had or superstar or, uh, or myself, you know, just, and uh, the fans thought that he was very beatable. Yeah. And, and he wasn't, you know. Uh, the Iron Sheik ended his run. You know, Sheiky, uh, yeah. I'm going to give you some real inside wrestling here. Okay. Uh, I like that. When, Bo when Bobby Backlund dropped the belt to the Iron Sheik, you know, prior to Hulk Hogan coming back in and uh, beating the Sheik. Yep. Well, Vince, but, but now Bobby told me this so it's not out of bounds and uh, I think Hulk Hogan told me too uh, so when uh, uh, Backlund had held the belt for six years I believe what was it six years just about, yeah. There's a, a title run where he technically loses to Inoki, but if you really look at it, it's a five-year title run. If you don't count the Inoki win in Japan, he really held it for five straight years, yeah. Yeah, okay, five years. Vince McMahon, uh, the old man had passed away at this time. So I think he had. And uh, uh, so Junior has the run of the company now. He comes to Backlund and says, Bobby, I'm going to switch the belt because Backlund was supposed to have it for another year or two. I'm going to switch the belt. You're not mar marketable anymore. I don't I don't know what to do with you. I, I, I can't market you uh, as a WWF champion anymore. And uh, Backlund really took that hard. And Bobby, Bobby told me. That's rough. And I says, wow, shit, you're over. I mean, but why change? Well, in the meantime, about six months prior to that, Vince flew out here to the AWA, out to Minneapolis, and had a meeting with Hulk and promised the Hulk you know, a million dollars a year guaranteed and the WWF title, everything. Well, how could Hulk turn that down? And so Vince was sinking, you know, down the road six months, eight months. Here, just a minute. 
so anyway, uh, 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 when uh, Hulk went back to New York, uh, he talked to me. He says, Kenny, why don't you come back now? I, I said, no, nah, not, not yet. I, I'll, I'll come back, but not right now. And Hulk told me what they were going to do with him. And so prior to Hulk, Backlund told me that Vince didn't think he was marketable anymore. And uh, But he didn't tell Backlund how they were going to switch the belt. And so uh, uh, anyway, the Iron Sheik was going to beat him. And then shortly after that, you know, a matter of weeks, yep. Hulk was going to beat the Iron Sheik uh, and uh, become a baby face. And that's how all that, that worked. And uh, the, most people don't know how that uh, belt switch evolved, but that, that's exactly what it was. Uh, Vince, uh, you know, yeah, but Vince had gone in his own head, had gone Hollywood. And he wanted showmen, and he wanted you know this and that, and so uh, yeah, so it was uh, into the road for Backlund, and it gave uh, Cosro Vasiri, the Iron Sheik, uh, who went to training camp with Ric Flair and I, <laughs> yep, yeah, nineteen seventy-two here in uh, Minnesota. God, that training camp was fucking brutal. We were out in one of Vergania's farms, and he had an old barn. That barn had more fucking holes in it than you could imagine. The wind would blow through there. Uh, 20 below zero was the last time we were in the barn. 20 below zero. Jesus. And we were out there for three, four hours. And, of course, in the barn, <laughs> full of holes, there was uh, no heat. And there's one little light bulb dangling from a, a light bulb uh, cord about, oh, I don't know, 20 feet above the ring. And uh, in the meantime, you had the chickens in the farm. Uh, you had cats. And the chickens would roost above the ring. And they'd shit all over the ring. You know, you, we'd come in the the morning, you know, about nine o'clock to start training camp, the ring would be covered with bird shit, you know, chicken shit. <laughs> Unbelievable. And and you guys are, you know, you're going to be the future of the business. You're training in that. Yeah. And, and the ring was uh, lumpy and hard, hard as a goddamn rock. It was like the floor. And, uh, we and uh, uh, Vern had different guys come in and work with us. You know, the, even Don Morocco came out once, or no, he came out a half a dozen times. Uh, our main uh, coach was uh, Billy Robinson from Manchester, England, the man of a, a thousand holds. But uh, like Larry the Axe Henning would always say, get on TV. So, I'm wrestling Billy Robinson, XX, you know, whatever. He claims to be the man of a thousand holes, but he's master of none. Oh, yeah. <laughs> God. Uh, yeah, but, uh, Larry the Axe, he didn't care for Billy. But Billy was a good coach. He taught us, uh, you know, how to break arms, how to break legs, how to break fingers. Uh, he taught us a lot of stuff. And, uh, but, uh, you know, then he taught us American style wrestling. He taught us uh, the catch style <clears throat> that they have over in England and Europe. And so it was, uh, but the, the training, you know, shit, we do like, uh, towards the end there, we were doing 500 free squats. Uh, and uh, uh, sit-ups, I don't know, hundreds. Probably 500 uh, uh, workout. 
push-ups, jumping jacks. We are wore out before we even learned a fucking headlock. I mean, Jesus Christ. I was 310 pounds. Ric Flair was about 280. And, of course, Cosro was Siri. He was 180, about 280 now. But back then, uh, he was always in shape. Uh, you know, Cosro wrestled in the Mexico Olympic Games for Iran, uh, uh, 180-pound class Greco-Roman. So he, and he was always in shape. He was like Backlund. Backlund and uh, the Iron Sheik, those guys could go, wow. You were mentioning, obviously, Sheik wins the title, then Hogan wins the title from the Sheik. But what do you think about Hulk Hogan and that title run? Because when Hogan is champ, I mean, changes the business. I mean, it, it launches WBF into the stratosphere. Yeah, well, that's because of Vince McMahon. You know, the, whoever was Vince McMahon's champion was going to get 110% of the uh, publicity and uh, – uh, the big push on TV yep. and the, the endorsement deal and, uh, you know, for everything. And so that's how that worked. And uh, so, uh, yeah, but that was the start of the Vince McMahon era, you know, and he was going to see to it that he was going to steamroll every promoter in the country. And that's when the, uh, when he put the belt on uh, uh, Hulk Hogan, that's when he went right across the nation and uh, put all these other promoters out of uh, business. When uh, he came to Minneapolis, you know, he took Hulk. Hulk wasn't a big deal here. Uh, well, he, he, I shouldn't say that. He, he, was a, he was a big deal, but not like in the WWF. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I wrestled Hulk a lot of times here. Uh, and uh, I probably 50, 60 times, 70 times, I probably wrestled Hulk when we were both here in the AWA. And uh, so Vince had a vision that his champion, Hulk Hogan, was going to be the poster boy of professional wrestling. Not just in the WWF, but everywhere. And that's what it turned out to be. Uh, yeah, he put uh, Crockett Promotions out of business. Uh, uh, Atlanta, uh, Dallas, uh, uh, um, AWA, all the promotions on the West Coast. Uh, except for Portland. I think Portland hung on. Uh, but San Francisco, L.A., and, uh, it, it, you know, people don't remember, they don't realize, there were like 23 or 25 promotions at that time, you know, all over the country. And most of them, you go and make a decent living. And uh, so there, that's... So when, when Vince set his eyes on a particular promotion, he'd go in and just crush him. Yeah, you know, like here in Minneapolis, like I say, he uh, took Hulk Hogan, then he took Gene Okerlund, the announcer, then he took Bobby Backlund, uh, without a doubt the number one manager uh, in wrestling at the time. Um, and uh, he took everybody he could and uh talent wise and uh which there's a shit carload of guys out of here that wound up in the wwf and i had already been in the wwf twice i think yep. prior to that so uh when i told hulk i said i'm not going to go with you right now but uh i'm gonna uh, I, i'll be back there again don't worry so i i called vince I got in a huffy puff with Vern. Uh, uh, Vern came to me one day at TV and says, how long you been here, Ken? I said, uh, almost two and a half years. I, I, I said, I love it here. Well, I think that's long enough. He says, uh, you can come back, but 
you're going to have to find some place to go. So I went home and I called Vince. Oh, should love to have you. Don't have any place for you right now, but in a couple months. I says, okay, I'll tell Vern that. And so I, uh, next week we had, t we had TV every Wednesday. So I went in and talked to Vern. And uh, I told him I was going to go to the WWF again. You know, that, that I was established there. I would worked with Bruno there. Uh, and, I, I, and I told him I really miss New York. Oh, fuck, I had a hissy fit. Any place, but, but you're going to go to work for Vince McMahon? Son of a bitch, you know, like it was sacrilege or something. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> away I went. <laughs> oh, and you man. got to and you got to feud with Hogan when you got there. I mean, you got some WWF yeah. championship matches. Uh, one in New York was a big one, then a huge one in Philly, which was on the Prism Network. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah I wrestled Hulk a lot, you know, all over the country. Jesus, I I don't even know how. I, I, I run all together. I probably wrestled Hulk 200 times. I'll tell you who I wrestled the most. I thought that I had wrestled Andre around 400 times. He said, no boss, 600 times. Oh my God. I said, really? He said, yeah. He said, all the battle Royals all over the country. That was like 150. And we were always the last two in the ring. I said, yeah, no, you're, you're right. And then all the tag teams, the six-man tag teams, the eight-man tag teams, the individual matches. We had like 250 uh, individual matches. And I'm, I said, your favorite subject in school was math, right? Yes. I said, that's why you remember all this stuff <laughs> yeah yeah i used to re favorite guy in the world to play cribbage with was andre i love playing cribbage with him he went about 60 percent of the time i mean we played all the time and uh he was a hell of a card player uh and uh, uh rummy he loved playing rummy but Cribbage was his favorite, and Cribbage was my favorite, too. And uh, after about a year, I said, Andre, give me some tips. What do you mean? Give me some tips on Cribbage so I can beat you more often, so we can level the playing field here. You beat me uh, six out of ten times. That's 60%. I only win 40%. We have to make it 50-50. <laughs> he started right. laughing. He started laughing his ass off. Oh, yeah. He must have liked you, though, because he let you shave his head. I mean, not let you, but, you know, storyline wise oh, he shaved your head. Yeah. So he must have liked you a little bit. Oh, we were good friends. Oh, yeah, very yeah, very good. We used to go out all the time, and uh, we used to uh, have dinner at, Oh shit! All all over the country, wherever we were, especially in Japan, when we were over to Japan together, uh, this one place, uh, uh, Rudy's. Rudy was a like a six foot three, three hundred pound German. Uh, maybe Rudy weighed three fifty, and he was older. He was about fifty five, maybe sixty at the time, but he had an unbelievable German restaurant. And it was downstairs in the basement of this big shopping mall over in Tokyo. So uh, uh, Andre took me and Dick Murdoch. Oh, a couple other guys. There were five or six of us. He says, Kenny, you know, the waitress come around. And uh, Kenny, you order the ham hocks. The ham hocks are that big they're unbelievable and i said okay I, I said andre why don't you just order ham hocks for everybody and which he did 
So Rudy comes over with a platter, a big fucking platter, all full of uh, different liqueurs, uh, Ruppelmann's, uh, Jägermeister, Goldschlager, and then the girls would come behind him with these big steins of beer, you know, like 25 ounce, uh, I don't know how many. And Rudy, the owner of the place, he sat down and drank with us. And God, he was a good guy. And uh, he, he spoke English real well. And he speak Japanese fluently. Of course, he lived in uh, Tokyo, and uh, that was one of the most fun dinners I ever had. Uh, drink uh, uh, Ruppelmann's, a Jägermeister, Goldschlager, pounding the beers, eating that. Are we? Yep, you're back. Okay, froze oh. for a second. Yeah, you're saying you're right in the middle of saying to be eating, the, finishing up that big ham hog. Yeah, and we ate. Everybody at the table ate two of those damn things, and they had to be three pounds a piece, three pounds of meat. By God, they were so good. And then of course they gave you the mashed potatoes and the sauerkraut and you know they, anything you wanted, but. Uh, we stuck with the ham hocks that night. God, what a meal. I had had, had, I've had ham hocks. As a matter of fact, when first time I ever had a ham hock, I was uh, competing over in Munich, Germany for the Olympic Games. And the day I was supposed to compete, September 5th, 1972, the terrorists came over the back fence and shot up the Jewish uh, athletes in their compound. And uh, so anyway, that happened like five, six in the morning. So then they come in at noon, I think it was, our uh, team manager, uh, Rudy Sablo, says, Ken, they've canceled the Olympics. No more. I said, no more Olympics? Yeah. I said, Jesus Christ, I trained four years for this fucking thing. And this shit... I, I was so pissed off. Uh, so I, I went down two floors from where I was staying. It was a high-rise condo building. I went down and uh, started talking to some of my uh, track and field buddies uh, that were on the track team. Uh, and, you know, shot putters and discus throwers, hammer throwers. So anyway, I says, hey, guys, they canceled the limit. Yeah, we just heard. I said, uh, you guys want to go downtown Munich? We can catch a sub subways right, be right below the Olympic Village. They said, yeah, let's jump on the subway and go downtown Munich. So we got downtown Munich, and uh, Munich has uh, uh, a big bar about every other uh, door. You know, you talk, man, those guys could drink over there. Yeah, at that time, they all smoked, and Jesus Christ, I think every German in Germany smoked and drank, and uh, which isn't a bad bad thing because we did too. So anyway, uh, that was uh, we found a restaurant about uh, blocked down from the Hofbrau House. Because the Hofbrau house was sold out. You, they had a line, uh, you know, a quarter mile long outside. So we went down uh, about a block and a half and found this other restaurant. And they, they were advertising their ham hocks, and their Wiener schnitzel and all this. I said, this looks like a good place. And it was. It was fantastic. So we went in there. We had the big ham hock, the Wiener schnitzel mashed potatoes, sauerkraut, every, oh, shit. And, of course, we were drinking the Jägermeister and the Big Steins of beer. We were so fucked up. Now, this is like four in the afternoon. We didn't get back on that subway until one or two in the morning. 
we had to because that was the last uh, subway uh, leaving downtown for the Olympic Village. And so we made the last uh, last run. So we get back and we're shooting the shit till about three, four in the morning. And finally, we all went to bed. About eight in the morning, Rudy Sablo, he comes back in my room. Kenny, Kenny, you got to get up. We got to go way in. Uh, I said, get out of here, Ruby, Rudy. I think I thought he's pulling a rib on me. Right. He said, no, no, they reinstated the, the games. Uh, you're on. You're competing uh, tonight. I says, oh, fuck. Man, am I hung over. My head's pounding. And uh, so anyway, we go over to the Olympic training hall and way in. It was almost a two-hour uh, bus ride over there because of the traffic. Traffic was horrible. So we get over there. We weigh in uh, about 11 in the morning. And uh, I look at the uh, – I says, you know, we're all super heavyweights. What the fuck are we weighing in for? Right. And uh, so anyway, one thing led to another. Yeah, so we get uh, – uh, well, the reason why everybody weighed in, because it, in case of a tie, then the lighter man would win automatically. Oh, wow. I didn't realize that. Oh, okay. Makes yeah. sense. You remember Paul, uh, Paul Anderson, uh, 1956. No. Yeah. The, the, he, he was uh, American strong man back in 56 and he did all kinds of stuff. He, he had a show out in Las Vegas after he had uh, turned professional, squatting uh, two barrels of uh, silver dollars. And, uh, you know, he'd bend horseshoes and drive nails through uh, uh, boards and stuff. He did all kinds of stuff. Anyway, he was from uh, Georgia and... Uh, Georgia strongman. I, I got to know Paul pretty good over the years. But anyway, uh, he tied in, in his uh, event, super heavyweight. He weighed uh, like 330. And uh, his main competitor weighed about 350 or 360. He's a great big guy, I think from Argentina or Brazil. Anyway, Paul and him tied, and Paul won, weighing 330 pounds for being the lighter man. Wow. So Paul got the gold medal because he was the lightest. And uh, pe people don't understand, you know, they don't realize that, but uh, yeah. it was actually a tie. So anyway, uh, uh, the hell was I going to say? Anyway, go ahead. A ask me something. <laughs> <laughs> As we start to wind it down, though, we'll, we'll head towards the finish here. I mean, we can ask you a million things, but we'll head towards the, the finish. Um, I know you were on Tales of the Territory. You were talking about AWA and then obviously the time there. The time you obviously you went to jail, so you missed a part of it. The McDonald's story. So, I mean, there is some stuff, but do you cover all that in the book? Yeah, it's all in there. Yeah, I was on a podcast, I think, yesterday or a couple of days. I've been on four or five podcasts this week. Uh, anyway, one of them, uh, um, oh, I know, it was one from Boston, I believe it was. Uh, Steve Falls, do you know Steve? Uh, it sounds familiar, yeah. I think he's from the Boston area. I think he yeah, he's from NBC, Boston. I think, or something like that, yeah. Yeah. I'm thinking so of the right guy. Yeah, so anyway, I was talking to him, and he didn't even ask if I would want to talk about that McDonald's bullshit. I know he you did. don't like to talk about it. I know that. I, I don't. I really don't. As a matter of fact, 20 years ago, some kid, I think I was in Philadelphia doing a shooting interview, and he kept asking me about that fucking McDonald's. I said, you ask me about that fucking shit one more time, I'm going to choke your ass out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. I would, have, 
because I was drunk. I was drinking beer the whole right, that was right. in the morning. I don't know. I think I drank about 20 fucking beers uh, by that time, you know. And uh, I was in my rowdy days. That's when I was 50. Oh, or no, yeah. I was 60. I was 60 then. Oh. Yeah, I'm, I'm 79. I, I'm a I'm almost eighty now. Yeah, and, I was just uh, uh, I was just curious. I, I figured it would be in the book, or hopefully it would be in the book, because I know you don't. You usually don't like to talk about it. I know that. Yeah, the people. Yeah, I I, I don't want to rehash it today. Yeah, one, of one time in a week is enough. <laughs> but, uh, the people want to. You, you know, you do a million things right throughout your whole life. You live a pristine existence you know you get along with everybody you fuck up one time and they bring it up one, to you constantly yep one fuck up that ever for the rest of your life uh that happened uh, uh back in the 80s uh, 40, 40 years 40 ago. years ago yeah 40 years ago almost exactly yeah. 40 years ago yeah yeah 40 years ago right now but that's good though. When people want to hear hear it from you, they'll can read the book. They can get the way to the world, and they could they could find out all about it. That's right. Here, I, I'm going to give you a website. Yes, please give us uh, the you know where everybody can get the book. Of course. Yeah. Walking on hot waffles is w o h w dot com. That that that's where uh, the bulk of the books. Uh, that was my writer. Uh, a kid by the name of Kenny Casanova. The, you've talked to Kenny, haven't you? Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, Kamala's book he wrote in Beefcake. I mean, he's a pretty good yeah. author. I mean, he's he's kind of um, not corner of the market, but you know, he, he's done a great job with the wrestling books for sure. Yeah, yeah. And Tito Santana. Oh, yeah. Tito, too. Yep. Yeah. Don't call me Chico. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, if, you, if you could post that for us, I would really appreciate it. Yeah, definitely will do. Yeah, and uh, if uh, people want to contact me, uh, they can uh, go to my website, uh, Ken Patera, 43, at hotmail.com. All right, awesome. Well, yeah, I, I love visiting with, uh, you know, people that are interested in, and what I did in my life, you know, it wasn't just wrestling. And, uh, you know, the, the weightlifting uh, was a big part of my life. And uh, I kind of wish, I, you know, after I uh, retired from wrestling uh, in the late 80s, I wish I had, uh, you know, gone back and uh, 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 got involved in the weightlifting scene. However, after I retired from wrestling in the late 80s, in 89, I opened up a health club in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. And uh, I had, God, what a time we had there. That was a, a moneymaker. That, 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 that was a, a license to print money. Um, I really did well there. And I had that gym open for nine years. And then, you know, it's, it's like anything else, you know, you open up a bar. How long is that bar going to stay open? Yeah, five, seven years, you know, and, uh, and uh, gyms are the same way. I, I, you know, I, I know some gyms that have lasted 20, 30 years, but in, in the latter years, they, they don't do well. Now, these big corporate gyms are... Yeah, a little different, but you know, not really. Now, pe people want to find a new location to go to and whatnot. And uh, when people are younger, you know, teenagers, young adults, they want to, you know, train all the time. But yeah. then as they get older, you know, they, they get married and have kids and they don't go to the gym very much anymore. And that's, a, you know, how uh, my situation was, you know, I had thousands of uh, members and then 
I had a thousand and eight hundred and six hundred. Five hundred was break even, so that'll give me an indication I was making a ton of money. Right. But uh, you know, I, I had tanning salon, uh, sports nutrition, um, um, sports apparel. Uh, personal training. I, I had everything going. I mean, I had a well oil machine and it was going and going. And, and I hated to close it, but uh, I made sure that all the members that were still active, I made sure that I got their memberships at other locations around St. Paul. And uh, I, anybody that wanted a refund, I refunded their money, uh, which only two, two members asked for refunds. And uh, so I, you know, people no, you keep the money, you know. So it, it went good. So I was up because a lot of these gyms that close, you know, they don't tell you. You come, come to work out the next afternoon, there's a fucking chain on the door or a, a sign saying not a business you know I, I i didn't do that you know i was um i paid the rent for about a month and a half two months and i i told everybody up front why i was closing and it was a fun uh fun run uh well i well it was open uh, but I just couldn't make it anymore on the uh, membership that I had uh, that I had left. Uh, I mean, I was making enough money to uh, pay the rent, and pay the light bill, but nothing else. Yeah, you know, <laughs> and, you know, I had a house payment, car payment. There, uh, you know, life uh, life continues. But, yeah. but Sarah, though, thank you so much for all the time. I really appreciate it. Everybody head over to WOHW.com and get the Weight of the World Ken Patera book. Thank you so much for all the time. Really appreciate it. Thank you, John. It was really sad. You said that we had met about four years ago? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Well, it was nice talking to you again. I appreciate your help with uh, getting my book out. Uh, and maybe we'll do it again. Yeah, hell yeah, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, buddy. All right. Thank Thanks. you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Bye bye.